So you've probably switched to an eSIM, and you're feeling pretty good about it, right? I mean, it makes sense. A hacker can't physically steal a little plastic chip that isn't even there. On the surface, it seems like a total security upgrade. And yeah, that's the common wisdom you'll hear everywhere. No card to steal, no port to swap. The logic seems totally solid, but here's the thing that assumption completely misses. By getting rid of that physical vulnerability, we've swung open the door to a whole new world of digital ones. Right now, in 2025, that belief isn't just wrong, it's dangerously outdated. There are three proven real-world techniques that let attackers, anyone from a common scammer to a sophisticated spy agency, hijack your eSIM profile completely remotely. They never have to touch your phone. So out of all the complex moving parts, what is the single weakest link that makes almost all of these takeovers possible? Well, we are going to answer that exact question by the end of this explainer. Stick around. All right, so here's how we're going to break it all down. First, we'll shatter that eSIM security illusion. Then we're going to get a little technical and look at the architecture so you understand how it all works. After that, we'll expose the top three hijacking techniques being used today, explain the core vulnerabilities, show you the red flags to watch for, and wrap it all up with a concrete protection plan you can put into action. First up, let's just demolish this central myth right from the get-go. The whole idea that no physical card equals no risk is a perfect example of focusing on an old threat while completely ignoring the new one. You know, with a physical SIM, the bad guy needed physical access. But the eSIM? It swaps that physical barrier for multiple, remote, internet-based ways to attack. And look, this table just lays it all out, plain and simple. Notice the shift in every single category. The attack vector goes from physical to remote. How you get your SIM goes from in-person to over the air. And here's the most critical one. The point of failure moves from your phone itself to a whole network of cloud servers. If an attacker can trick those servers, they don't need your phone. All they need is an internet connection. Okay, so to really get why these hacks work, we got to look under the hood at the technology. In any eSIM activation, there are basically three core pieces doing a digital dance. You've got your device, you've got the operator's server, and then you've got the method that connects the two. So, inside your phone, you've got this really important piece of software called the Local Profile Assistant, or LPA. Just think of it as the manager, the gatekeeper, for everything eSIM on your phone. It's the software that actually asks for, installs, manages, and even deletes your mobile profiles. And this is a super important detail. The LPA is not just some random app. It runs with high-level system privileges. That means it has deep, powerful access to your phone's hardware, especially the secure chip where eSIM profiles live. It needs this power to do its job, like writing your secret keys into a protected area. But, as you're about to see, that power also makes it a massive target for serious attackers. Okay, next up, over on your carrier side of things, we have the SMDP1. The full name is a mouthful. Subscription Manager Data Preparation Plus. Let's just call it the SMDP1. Think of it as a super secure digital vault where the master copy of your SIM card is created, encrypted, and kept safe before it ever gets sent to your phone. This server holds the absolute crown jewels of your mobile identity. It generates and stores your IMSI, that's your unique ID on every cell network in the world, and the secret cryptographic key called the CHI. Those two little pieces of data are what lets your phone prove it to you every single time it connects to a cell tower. The entire security of your mobile connection depends on that data staying secret and getting to your phone's LPA without anyone else seeing it. So you see what's happening here? The LPA on your device has to talk to the SMDP Plus server across the internet to download your profile. The entire system is built from the ground up to be remote. And that very feature, that convenience of doing everything from anywhere, is exactly what creates the opportunity for a remote hijacking. Okay, foundations are set. Now for the main event. Let's get right into the top three ways that hackers are actively stealing phone numbers right now by hijacking eSIMs. Attack number one is the classic and honestly the most common one you'll see, the social engineering swap. It's all about exploiting people. The attacker finds some of your basic info online, which is scarily easy after all those data breaches. Then they call up your carrier support line with a sob story, like, Hi, I just dropped my phone and it's shattered. I got a new one and I desperately need to move my number over. If the carrier uses weak security questions, your address, the last four of your social, the attacker can often just bluff their way through. The helpful support agent then deactivates the eSIM on your phone and sends a shiny new activation code to the attacker. And just like that, you've got no service and they've got your number. This happens all the time with the big guys, AT&T, T-Mobile, Vodafone, you name it. 
Attack number two is all about intercepting the QR code, and it's devastatingly effective. Think about it. When you get a new ESM, how does the carrier usually send it to you? In an email with a QR code. And that email, with that simple little black and white square, that is literally the key to your kingdom sent completely in the clear. And this shows you exactly why. See, that QR code isn't just a funky design. It's structured data. It contains the exact web address of the operator's SMDP Plus server and, this is the kicker, a one-time activation token that proves the request is legit. If an attacker gets that code, they can just scan it with their phone. Their phone's LPA connects to the server and says, hey, I've got a valid ticket, give me the profile, and the server does. Game over. If your email gets hacked or you carelessly share a screenshot of that code, your line is gone. It's an instant takeover. And now we get to attack number three, full-on device compromise. This is the big one. It's not as common for the average Joe, but for advanced groups, we're talking spy agencies, high-level corporate espionage, this is the method of choice because it's so powerful and so stealthy. So let's say your phone gets hit with some nasty malware, or even worse, one of those zero-click exploits like Pegasus that you don't even have to click on. The attacker can gain direct control over the local profile assistant, that super powerful software we talked about. And once they're in control of the LPA, they own you. They can silently tell it to transfer your profile to them. They could install a second, hidden eSIM to spy on all your calls and texts. Or they could just wipe your profile and replace it entirely. This method bypasses every single security check at the carrier because the evil command is coming from the trusted device itself. Okay, let's take a breath and just recap why this new technology, for all its cool features, opens up these new doors for attackers. From a hacker's point of view, remote is always better than physical. It's easier, it's cheaper, and it's a lot less risky for them. And eSIMs make the whole process remote by design. It really boils down to these key points. As the user, you don't have a physical thing to hold on to and protect anymore. The whole system hinges on cloud servers you have zero control over. The human element at the carriers is still a major weak point because of bad identity checks. The keys to the kingdom, those QR codes, are sent over regular, insecure email. And finally, the very software on your phone that manages the eSIM is a juicy, high-privileged target for malware. All right, that's a lot of doom and gloom. But how do you actually know if you're under attack? Because this can all happen in minutes. Let's go over the critical red flags, the warning signs that you need to be watching for. The biggest, most in-your-face sign is your phone suddenly showing no service. It just drops off the network completely. That means your eSIM has been shut down. At the same time, anyone who tries to call you will go straight to voicemail. You might even get a weird notification from your phone saying an eSIM profile was added or removed. And then the real pain begins. Your banking apps, your social media, they all start asking you to log in again. That's the attacker using your number to reset your passwords. And of course, you'll stop getting any two-factor codes sent by text. If you see this happening, you have to act fast. Okay, deep breath. Now for the most important part of this entire explainer, how you fight back. This isn't a lost cause. There is a clear six-step plan you can follow that will dramatically slash your risk of being a victim. First, and I mean do this today, call your carrier and ask for a number lock or a port freeze. This puts a special pin on your account that stops the social engineering attack dead in its tracks. Second, when you get a new eSIM, do not accept a QR code over email. Insist on using the carrier's official app, which creates a secure connection. Third, log into your carrier's website and turn on two-factor authentication. But, and this is critical, do not use SMS for it. Use an authenticator app. Using SMS to protect the account that controls your SMS is just a recipe for disaster. Four, lock down your email account. Strong password, strong 2FA. Treat it like your bank account because it's the gateway. Five, don't ignore those notifications about eSIM profile changes. That's your alarm system. And finally, number six, be super careful about the apps you install, particularly on Android. Never ever grant device admin access unless you know exactly what you're doing. And that brings us all the way back to the question I asked at the very beginning. What is the single weakest link? Well, here it is. It's not the fancy encryption. It's not the secure hardware on your phone. It is, as it almost always is, the human element. It's that gap between powerful remote technology and the support agent using weak verification questions. It's the gap between convenience and our own security habits. The technology is amazing, but it's only as secure as the people and the processes that protect it. Now you know how it works, and more importantly, you know how to stop it. If you found this useful, subscribe for more explainers that cut right to the chase on tech security.
We'll see you in the next one.